You're on mute. You're on mute, McKenna. All right, there we go. Welcome to another one of APSA's interactive sessions of the 2023-2024 academic year. We are pleased to host tonight's session with current MD, DO, PhD program directors to answer your general questions about how to succeed in your interviews. I'd now like to have our wonderful pan panelists go around and introduce themselves, including their current institutions. To be efficient, I'll call on you by name. First, we have Dr. Payne. Good evening, everybody. Again, I'm Gregory Payne. I'm one of the assistant directors um, for the UAB MSTP, and I'm a physician scientist in vascular disease and general cardiology. Dr. Fornoni. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Alessia Fornoni. I'm a physician scientist by training, and I'm a nephrologist, and I'm the director for the MSTP program at the University of Miami. And Dr. Gray. Hi, everyone. I'm John Gray. I am the director of the MD-PhD program at the University of California, Davis. Um, I'm just starting my second year in the position um, and uh, looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you all. You want my background? I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist um, and have a basic science lab. Perfect. And to the panelists, I must say thank you all for being here. We're grateful you took the time out of your day to come virtually to our meeting to provide your wisdom and pearls to folks about applying to MD-PhD programs and their upcoming interviews. Uh, my name is Michaela. I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm a second year MD-PhD student at the University of Kentucky. Uh, in the chat box, helping us moderate as well will be Tuba. So any questions you have, please feel free to put them in the chat. And our live uh, volunteer tweeting the event will be Clay. For those of you who are going to step away or miss a piece of the event, as a reminder, we will have it recorded. As the moderator, I'll remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. We have already received those submitted during the registration process. And we have them queued. We have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting questions live. You can submit the questions in the chat box. I think that's all the announcements that I have. Thank you again for all being here. And I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. All right, our first question. What are some high yield questions that I can prepare for? And anyone who would like to take this, if you feel like you have a good answer of what questions you feel like um, applicants should prepare for. I'll, I'll jump on it because I feel like the last person to have to speak is going to be the most difficult. Um, I think clearly one thing that is going to differentiate an interview for an MSCP or MD PhD program is, you know, what's your what's your passion for science um, that would be uniquely different from what you get may get from just a medical school interview. So um, for us, I think our very vague question is usually, you know, what is driving you and explain why you feel like a dual degree pathway is, is a necessity uh, for your type of training. What yeah, you I mean, John, I, yeah. I, I, I would add that, um, the, you know, what, it's not a specific question. It's what we're watching. We're kind of evaluating the entire time, which is how you speak about your past research experiences. And this is, you know, very similar to how we review PhD students in that regard. Um, but we want to see how deeply that you have thought about your projects. Um, you know, are you speaking at the about your work as at like a technician level, or or were you really engaged in the scientific questions and driving the projects? Um, and we don't really ask that as a question. It's it's you telling us about your your science and us following up with kind of questions, you know, of interest based on what you're telling us. Um, but we want to see how how deeply that you think about your science. And I can second that. I agree with that. But I really want to grasp how passionate about you are uh, about science. Now, I think the passion, the sense of intellectual curiosity is what really is not so much how much experience you have. Obviously, that's important. But is it the, really a career choice? Because it is a career choice now. So how early can we actually perceive that that's happening because you really are addicted to this wonderful job that is to be a physician scientist. That's where my questions are really about grasping this sense of curiosity about generating new knowledge versus applying existing knowledge. That's what we do when we are straight physicians. 
All right, thank you all three for those great answers. Another question we got was, how do programs usually feel about students with disabilities? Are there systems in place to support students and staff and help them? Do you think such topics, even if they were important in essay material, should be discussed in interviews? And I feel like since all three of you are from different programs, I'm not sure if you have a different approach to this. So maybe all three of you could go if that's all right. I, I think you are, you only benefit yourself by describing all of the challenges that you have uh, experienced that has led you to be who you are and, and drive your, your career interests and your goals um, and shows your tenacity and your resilience, um, you know, throughout the whole process. It, you know, those kinds of things are really a part of the holistic review that we, that we look at. Um, these are, you know, when people have, uh, you know, challenges in their life that, um, that they, you know, kind of power through and get to the point where they're, you know, super successful in applying for these kinds of positions, you know, those are positive traits that we uh, like to see, especially in the sciences, which, you know, we, in science, we deal with, you know, a lot of rejection and, and challenges in those regards. Um, and it shows, you know, that uh, somebody has resilience and grit and determination. Um, so it, it's not, I, I, it's absolutely not considered a negative, at least to me, um, <laughs> in any way. Um, you know, at the same time, from a legal perspective, there are med schools have technical standards, depending on, you know, there are certain disabilities that from the technical standards list, I don't, it's not something I have memorized that, um, you know, may be, preclude somebody from, you know, being accepted into a medical school, but from an MD, PhD per, uh, program perspective, that's not something I, I even consider. Yeah, I think uh, really, I'm lucky enough to be at an institution where diversity is natural. Uh, I'm in, uh, in the Caribbean more than in the United States, in Miami. So it's, uh, uh, we have definitely a lot of diversity, but we have also a lot of disability. And uh, I think actually, if I look at the record of our uh, disability students, I think maybe driven by the desire to, uh, to modify conditions, um, they've been very successful in uh, building great metrics for the program. So we are all very supportive of uh, disability students. Uh, as of today, uh, one of our MSTP students that is received a kidney transplant when he was 12 actually got a 31 fellowship. So I think it's really amazing. So we are really supportive of that. And the medical school, I think, is a little bit more... Um, difficult to accommodate just because the schedule, the operational schedule of the medical school has less flexibility, but we had uh, fantastic stories of uh, people that actually time their uh, internships and their time on wards and the time standing up uh, and the needing to clean the scare, parking allocations to really serve their needs. And so I'm very proud to represent a very inclusive, diverse, and supportive of uh, uh, disability students' environment. Yeah, I'll I'll echo both of those uh, responses and say UAB, um, in, in my opinion, is incredibly supportive of students um, with disabilities or in, even students with divergent um, kind of backgrounds. Uh, to your question uh, or to the question about disclosing or discussing that during um, applications. I think um, I wouldn't say that it's my job to tell an applicant what they disclose or not disclose. I feel like if it's part of, if it's important to your story and why you're applying to the program and why you're interested in, in this pathway, then by all means discuss it. I don't think it's ever going to be used against you uh, as an applicant. Um, mm -hmm. If it's something you, that, that you're not comfortable disclosing or discussing, you're not you're not forced to do it. Um, um, and if it's something that if you matriculate in and then disclose it, that's also something we're supportive of. So um, I think the the ball is really in every applicant's court as far as how much they want to share and discuss. Um, and we will kind of follow along with them. But at the end, uh, I think John mentioned this, it, it really all is going to tie back to your passion uh, for why you want to pursue this. Um, 
And I think if we perceive that you're passionate, then we're passionate about supporting you um, in that mm -hmm. process. Yeah, I second that. I don't think it weakens the application to disclose if you think yeah. it's important to build your cause or, or yeah. your passion. If it was, if this was a key element to build your passion for this career, it's important to disclose it. All right. Yeah, if it's if it's relevant, talk about it. If it's relevant, um, correct. That's a positive. If it's not relevant to any of it, there's no absolutely no need to disclose it. All right, we have our first question in the chat. How can I effectively highlight the significance of my clinical research experience and my application, especially in comparison to traditional wet lab research? Well, it's difficult to 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 uh, leverage this now because clinical research experience span from being a clinical research coordinator where you notoriously know how to interact with patients, collect uh, a consent, but doesn't necessarily translate into an abstract or a co-authorship. And so I think it's very uh, different from a clinical research where you do data analysis of existing database with a clinical researcher and you are able to present the data to a meeting. So I think in general, for those of you that are interested to engage in clinical research, I would encourage to look at the clinical research that would allow you to be a contributor towards that, you know, because yes, it's great to say it's, otherwise it becomes like a, a sort of a community service where you do the service, but you don't get recognition for what you do. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah. in that way, it's very similar to being a technician in a lab. You're yeah. running <laughs> Western blots, but you're not necessarily, as you know, really involved in the in the science and you're not really driving or you know directly participating in the question and answering the questions um, so that's what we would look for um, if it's clinical research and, and I'd, I'd say the the same thing and, and to the question as far as how to um, highlight that in the application I think really for it, it's helpful to us if you flush out where that contribution is um, because it, it's I think in my experience, a lot more difficult to be independent, uh, quote unquote, with some of your clinical research, especially if it's a large enterprise, but really highlighting where you've contributed and what what your participation was will help us decipher, um, is this the type of research we're looking for? Is it something um, uh, that's more on par with a technician or coordinator? All right, and further on that question, uh, I was just curious, do your programs or you all have a preference towards a, an applicant's prior experience in being clinical versus wet lab? I, I can answer that we we really do not. Um, so we support a, a really wide variety of um, uh, canon, if you will, for where you can get your PhD. Um, and so uh, that's very supportive of everything from population health all the way down to, you know, very, very basic. Um, but again, I think the the foundation has to be kind of that academic uh, curiosity and some independence of thought uh, to some degree. And, and that can come in a lot of different flavors. Same year, a lot of our students gain a PhD in AP or in public health, and we're very supportive of that. For the most, they're very successful in that area. Uh, so it really depends whether your training before applications meets your desire to engage in a specific graduate program or not. Uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, we're more reluctant if there is somebody with a lot of uh, clinical research experience and then wants to do in the wet lab space or vice versa. But if you use your strength to build on them, that's valued a lot. Yep, I'd say exactly the same thing. All right. And what are some questions you want students to ask during interview? I want, I want my students to come. So, no, I don't sorry. know. Go ahead. I was I was being a little bit uh, flippant, but I, I think they need to ask the questions that they have. The, um, I want to know their genuine genuine interest, and that's only kind of driven by what their what their in, you know true questions are rather than these are the questions they should or should not be asking. I want to make sure they actually have done, I test whether they've done their homework. Because as you know, the most successful outcome for physician scientists is proper mentorship. 
So I want students that apply to my institution to have done the homework to look who could be a potential mentor doing the PhD here. Uh, because if they've not even looked up at the institution who could be a mentor, then I perceive I perceive that there's lack of interest. So I really want to see the homework being done ahead and to say, hey, I would love to have this individual. The, the rationale for why my institution, why the mentors here would be a good fit for you. It's a very important question for me to address during interview time. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd, I'm far more like John in the sense that it's it's just a conversation. And um, I'd just like to know that they're engaged in the conversation we're having. And it's far more of a, a feel. So I, I hate to not necessarily dodge the question, but to say that there's no specific question that I'm, I'm holding my breath waiting for someone to ask. Um, but just to know that they're conversant and can, again, communicate at the level that we're, we're kind of expecting of our trainees. And then to follow up on that, because you brought up uh, doing your homework and such, we had a question that most MD or most PhD only applicants have to select a PI from one department assuming they have scoped research interests, but a lot of MD-PhDs are open to a variety of fields for their PhD. This means the pool of PIs to choose from is much larger. Since MD-PhD admissions are also on a longer time scale, what advice do you have for narrowing down a PI based on mentorship style and overall compatibility versus research fit alone? Well, I will, what I would say first and foremost is um, not to, to tell the uh, person asking the question. One is the pressure is not there to necessarily find that fit. Um, um, I think to the point of doing your homework, if you say you're interested in genetics or genetic therapeutics, um, I would love to see that you're listing faculty that you want to meet with or asking questions about what you say you're interested in. So that's to me, the doing your homework aspect to uh, my specific institution. Uh, but we all know that interests are going to change. I personally came in saying one thing and then my interest changed over the first two years of medical school. So I would have picked my uh, alma mater for one reason, but ultimately trained in a different one. So um, that part of finding that mentor, kind of researching it will be organic, I think in the first year or two, and that's part of your rotations that you'll be doing on the front end. Um, so I don't think there's any, we don't have an expectation that they're gonna find the mentor. If anything, we take some of that responsibility to hopefully expose you to people we think or mentors we think would be good or a good fit for, for what you're stating as your interest. Yeah, you do definitely don't need to have it all figured out ahead of time um, for MD PhD programs. I like to see someone having a, a pretty well described specific interest. Um, but that interest, if there's nobody at my institution that is doing anything related to that, and you don't know that that's going to be a problem. Um, and, but if, you know, we're, a, you know, a powerhouse in X, Y, Z, and that's, you know, right in what you are really interested in and you're able to describe that, that is, that is a very positive uh, thing. Um, but even then we know that interests change and um, like Dr. Payne said, my, you know, my interests change during the program as well. Uh, I did not start an MD-PhD program thinking I was going into psychiatry. So, um, you know, things change. Yeah, I agree. Things change. So it's important to leave the door open. It's only for those applicants that come really committed to a given discipline where I feel like if uh, I don't have that strength in my institution in terms of mentorship, I'd rather discourage an applicant away than, than invite to come just because the applicant is wonderful, no? Uh, again, it comes down to can we can we match the mentor mentee uh, relationship properly or not? And but but again, um, doors are open and opinion change. So um, I don't think that's so important to know exactly where you want to go when you come in. Yeah, and you also if you write that you're only interested in working with this one particular person maybe they're a superstar maybe they have a ton of money and a ton of trainees um it's also possible that in the two to three years before you're actually in the lab they could move somewhere else um and then what do you do so um it's good to see um that there are broad interests uh at the place that you're applying that that would be a you know up your you know up your alley 
All right, this next one is, once the secondary application for MD-PhD programs is submitted, is there anything that can be done to increase chances of receiving an interview offer? The worst you can do is to write uh, uh, an excessive amount of email to the program director. <laughs> Uh, because that's perceived for the most as a sign of weakness. That's my opinion. I think, uh, again, if you identify a potential mentor that is really a role model that you want to work with, maybe working through that person that would eventually reach out to the MSTP leadership and say, hey, I really need this person here, has higher probability of success than the writing excessively to the program directors. I think Dr. Gray touched on this. Um, I think part of for our secondary process, um, I could say in general, the questions are meaningful. So, um, you know, answer them to the best of your ability. And I think we use our secondary to really answer the question of like, why, why us? And why does, why does this, why does this fit? Um, we have several applicants that are outstanding on paper, but not a good mix mission match or match for what we can offer and we think as a program or an institution is really going to support. And that's where the secondary really bears that out. Um, and so that may be a decision between interview, offer, later offer, or no offer at all. Um, and so I think as you're answering that, just keep in mind that that's usually most secondaries I know for us is a part to figure out why, you know, why, why should we move forward with you as opposed to a number of other talented applicants. Yeah, it's we we definitely follow a holistic review and those questions on the secondary are, you know, a big part of it. It's actually the first thing I look at on every application. I don't look at anything else first. That's the first, you know, unless I'm manually screening primaries, but uh, for secondaries, it's the first thing I look and it tells me who do what what members of my committee do I want to review this application um, and you know what are their interests in in potentially coming here um, but it, it's it, it becomes a ma major part of the overall holistic review we don't like rank our applicants in like one to 200 or something like that it's it's really um, uh, you know the, those that have you know, clear interests are, are, are definitely brought, you know, up into the forefront. Genuine interests, connection to the area, those kinds of things are, are all are weighed heavily. All right. When considering a gap year, should you apply and defer or wait to apply? What are the main things to consider when starting medical school applications? So I guess consider just the, the gap year more so, should you defer or wait to apply? Like what are the variables that you think are important in that process to consider before deciding to apply versus defer? I think one of the one of the warnings I give any undergraduate who's considering a gap year, and, and I'd say a, a good number of our applicants or matriculants have taken a gap year. Uh, most of them have done it to continue on with some type of post back research. Um, and so what I warn or caution people on is if you're taking a gap year is or what's your gap year you, to do what? Um, so if it's continued research, getting more exposure in that, that will be seen as a positive. If I look at your gap year and I'm struggling to figure out what you did with it, or you did something that was not research related and are not in line with what your stated goal is. Um, I think that's a little bit of thin ice as far as moving forward. So, um, you know, I think in the flip side too, is that if someone is prepared and ready to apply, um, this is a really long process um, uh, for everything to get to where you are now to where we sit as far as physician scientists. So I don't encourage people to take a gap year just to take one. Um, I don't see that as a benefit, but if you think you need it or you want to take it, just make sure it's something you can speak to when we do uh, come to talk to you as far as an interview. You know, yeah, the national, oh, go ahead. I think if you're engaging such an outstanding research project and you want to be part of it and complete and you see like a major uh, opportunity to come for you to be there, you know, I don't see this career about how fast you get there but uh, really how, um, how strong you get there when you get there, no? So um, 
so I think it's uh, it's a possibility uh, to 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 take a gap year in that respect. Yeah, it's very individualized. I know that because you know this is a long career path. You take the program, you take residency, fellowships, postdocs, junior, you know, uh, professor, associate, assistant professor. It's a long path, and um, you know there has been discussion among MD PhD programs about how do we reduce this growing number of gap years. You know, how do we kind of stave that off and recognize potential earlier on. Um, and it's, that's a very challenging question, especially, uh, that, that ultimately if we just decided to do that, um, you know, it's going to really limit people that don't have the same opportunities to do significant research as an undergrad. Um, and sometimes you need that dedicated year to really explore that, that research potential, um, and, and really, uh, uh, you know, make a informed decision of your career. So it's, it's individualized. There's no right or wrong with that. Um, as those numbers get longer and longer, um, we start to take note of why is there three years of gap years and what was done in that time. Um, at the same time, it, you know, other than cost, I mean, I guess it doesn't, if you've experienced some research and you have probably have some strong letters, you know, it's, you know, when we are evaluating an application, we look at how much time they had to do the research that they are doing. And, you know, if we can see that somebody was really deeply involved with the research and uh, maybe did presentations and maybe, you know, may or may not have been on a publication, but was really involved in the science without a gap year, um, the gap year is not going to necessarily help that application that much. Um, if you did not have the opportunity to have that kind of experience before you graduate, then the gap year could be extremely beneficial. So, you know, it's not a, it's, it's an individual question um, and there's no right or wrong. Um, but it, it all ultimately comes down to how, you know, how well can you show that you are prepared and, and interested in this career path? To follow up, what are the benefits of being a non-traditional MD PhD student, and where do you find support uh, as being a non-traditional MD PhD student? And I guess further, do your programs have different things to offer for non-traditional students, or help in terms of maybe like family planning or things like that, or daycare cost coverage? I think that's what they're looking for. We implemented a great family policy uh, at the institution. The cost of living in Miami is being grown dramatically. So, and but we really want, uh, we really focus on the wellness of our students. So we incremented the policy where we give actually a supplement of five thousand dollar per child, uh, to every student that every child per year, and these remain through the MD or the PhD year. It doesn't matter. I think that has been actually very fruitful in uh, growing the family of the MSCP students and program. Uh, so I'm very, I'm very proud of that. It's still difficult to, you know, we, we've been adjusted the salary compensation also quite dramatically uh, uh, to, to all the students. And I think uh, to, to, to really allow for a reasonable um, lifestyle. We don't have a daycare, dedicated daycare, although we have been, the students have been thinking about building one <laughs> among themselves. I, I would say we're, I think, fortunate in, in Birmingham that it's a very family friendly, family accepting kind of environment. So that's inherently, if you look at our program, and I think for, for folks that are interviewing, they will see that there's a real diversity of students that are kind of your prototypical um, straight through college students all the way to having family and large family spouses and all of the responsibilities that come along with that. Um, as was mentioned before, uh, UAB has a daycare, but it's not dedicated to students or staff. And so I would be disingenuous to tell you that we had a, uh, you know, really um, mm -hmm. uh, strong uh, family support network for anybody or any employee. But, um, you know, students do have benefits as far as for those with 
uh, child care responsibilities, having um, differences in, in uh, stipends and salaries and things of that nature. But um, the program is very supportive of it and, and helpful when where they can be. Yeah, I wouldn't say our program has anything specific to offer other than support. Um, uh, but there are lots of different resources, both um, in the graduate programs and, and in the medical school. Um, the students at UC Davis are, are, the graduate students are in a union. So there's uh, child care benefits that were part of their contract um, that was recently renegotiated. Um, so there are things that are that are included in as a program. We're, we're supportive of people using all of the resources that are available. I like the five thousand dollar supplement though, and I wrote that down for my yeah, next we, ask. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's been great actually and very encouraging towards having kids. You know, it's a, a peculiar age, and eight years is a long period. So I yeah, think it's important, important to support that. And we also, I just want to mention, we also supported. Uh, uh, co-payment for emergency medical care bills. So if one of our students needs to seek emergency room for one of their issues, uh, we we have a $500 copay from the MSTP program for their bills. That's awesome. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a reminder that this session will be recorded a team of co-moderators is gathering submitted questions, which is where I'm pulling from. These questions come from the registration link and in real time, the chat box and Twitter. And then further, we have a link that we will send out so you can continue to have access to the answers to these questions. All right. And following up, this is a more applicant specific question. They would like to know, they said, I have a 502 MCAT, but 4.0 GPA strong research CV, including NIH, should I apply or should I wait? I can start maybe. So the although there's no national data that correlate NCAT score to the outcome of a great uh, physician scientist. And so I don't judge anybody based on NCAT score. The fact is a lot of the institution um, and medical school have their ranking based on the MCAT of the students. So many institutions, including mine, have an MCAT limitations that uh, it's just it's imposed to maintain the ranking of the institution. So uh, while I don't necessarily believe that MCAT say anything about the success of decision scientists, we have to obey to the rule of the institution about a minimal NCAT for applications. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, for the applications as described, um, uh, I would probably say favor on the side of applying. It's definitely something we will discuss. Um, we, like was mentioned before, we have minimums um, that are expected. Um, and Again, I think what it comes to, there's multiple standardized testing in, in medical school, and you're going to be juggling not only your academic interests, but also just the need to pass through these exams and not being able to pass them is um, going to be an a impediment you can't overcome um, in, in this process. So um, if there are explanations for why it's there or attempts to retake the test, restudy for the test, all of those are um, I think viable uh, to show that you've you've had an improvement on it. Um, but with that being said, if if you feel strongly that you want to apply, that's um, I think that's up to to your decision. This is also where I say trying to get direct feedback and mentorship from uh, whether it be our program officers or directly chatting with with other programs is helpful. Um, as far as are there minimums or is this a is this a futile effort? Yeah, those are those are great points. We don't have a an official minimum cutoff or anything like that. But I did have a situation last year where there was an applicant that I was very interested in that, you know, MCAT was, I don't think, $4.99. Um, and the med school just said, we can't do that. Um, we're, we're worried that um, the person would struggle too much in medical school and the and the you know, standardized exams and would require too much, you know, advisor resources to, to help them. Um, 
So, um, you know, I gave that person a suggestion, you know, work really hard to bring that score above 500 and apply again. Um, but otherwise, there's not really a cutoff um, that we think about, but it is put in the context of can they succeed in medical school, which is difficult. It's fast, furious, and, um, you know, it's a lot to learn and requires good test taking skills, unfortunately, to, to really succeed. Um, but like uh, uh, Dr. Fornoni said, that doesn't correlate to someone's success as a physician scientist. I think Penn did a big study on that of their uh, uh, trainees over time. And, it, you know, the MCAT scores correlated with USMLE scores, but other but did not correlate to number of publications or number of grants or anything else. And then to follow up, do your programs have stated scores or ranges on your website that applicants can find if they're interested in seeing if they should apply to your program? We don't have it publicized. Um, I think uh, Dr. Gray mentioned probably 500, um, maybe around that mark, but um, we don't, we, we too do not have an official cutoff, if you will. Um, it's all taken in the process with this holistic review. Uh, but it, uh, again, would be disingenuous saying that that's not gonna be a uh, difficult hurdle to overcome no matter what's in your application, um, unless there's some really extenuative circumstances that can, can be explained by it. I mean, same here. Uh, uh, we can always go back to medical school and build a rationale, but uh, for the most, uh, there's always a, a, a demand and they are also involved in the final decision. So it's difficult to, to push. We can push for interview of uh, poorly scored students, uh, but we cannot push for admissions. All right, what qualities do successful MSTP students have in your programs? What are some qualities that you've seen that are repeated that you think make your students successful? Curiosity, 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 again. And I don't know, for me, it's really the sense of intellectual curiosity, the passion, the inability to sit on the... Um, on the unknown, the desire to generate new knowledge and the humbleness actually. I think uh, I really I really uh, um, have difficulties when students come and give the idea that they know it all already. And uh, I really like the humbleness of saying, you know, I'm here to learn and I'm excited about a career that is a continuous learning process. Uh, I love to see that uh, humbleness in applicants. Yeah, they can't understate the value of that kind of unbridled curiosity because, you know, and as a physician scientist, as you get further along in your career, the demands for your time become larger and larger and the space for, you know, deep thinking becomes smaller and smaller. Um, and it's really just the curiosity that that keeps things, you know, driving forward. You know, I think all physician scientists with successful careers, that's what keep what that's the commonality um, that even when they're busy, they still are thinking about the questions. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you they use the word curiosity. It's it's excitement, I think, for us. Um, uh, that excitement when you get a result that you've been working for for a couple months and it's there um, and sometimes it's far and few between that's that's what I think keeps all of us uh, going in business is trying to hit that that high again of the next next discovery that leads to the next question um, and I really like the idea of humility I mean I think um, we talk about humility in medicine all the time and wanting to care for folks but uh, as scientists we're really you know, caring for knowledge and having a respect for that and realizing that it is not, no one is privileged to do this type of work. This is, again, hard work. Uh, and so having the students that have succeeded the most have approached both medicine and science with that kind of sense of humility and work ethic that sees them through and, and knowing that, you know, the institution you graduated from, the one you're about to matriculate to, 
none of those things really matter when you're trying to discover something. It's all about what's what what you're willing to put into it. Yeah, and we do assess for their someone's criteria, and you know their, you know how if we think they'll be a good physician. Yeah. So do, are they someone that conveys, you know, a level of maturity and integrity and empathy and, um, you know, cares for others and, um, you know, I and I we put a lot more emphasis on that in MD PhD interviews than I say, for example, when I do PhD interviews. Um, it's just I'm not evaluating if they're going to be a future physician. Um, and um, but for MD PhD students, that is important, and we're we do the primary primary interviews uh, for our applicants, so it's important that we assess those uh, traits as well. One thing I'll, I'll also add is, um, you know, science is a lot about teamwork, um, and so Dr. Gray mentioned, like, are you going to be a good physician? I think one of the things our best students also are um, not necessarily, you know, leaders in the the classic sense of things, but either team members, people willing to work together, uh, knowing that that's going to make for a good science, uh, a good graduate student, a good scientist, and then also being a part of a team. I think we're always a part of teams. So we're looking for that as well as who who can play well with, work well with others, um, and continue to move forward. All right. For this question, I'm not sure that you all can speak for every program, but they're wondering, in general, will programs continue to do Zoom slash virtual interviews for the foreseeable future? And if so, do you have any tips on conveying my personality or passion about a program in a virtual interview? Eye contact. <laughs> I like to have eye contact with a student I interview and understand we have different personalities and some are more shy than others. Uh, but I, I think it's very important to look in the camera uh, when you actually try to convey a passion for what you do. Um, that's, uh, you know, my my number one recommendations. And I may come up with more, but I will let Greg and John. Yeah, virtual is hard, um, but we probably will continue it for the foreseeable future. There's, uh, you know, a significant amount of uh, you know, improved kind of equity for applicants when they don't have to travel to multiple different institutions. Um, and that's really our deciding factor for continuing it. The med school has made the same decision um, to keep things going virtual for now. Um, you know, we'll reassess in the future, but, you know, it is a little bit more challenging of that interpersonal connection. Um, you know, it definitely is for me as well. So, um, it's just something to, you know, set up, make sure your setup is in the right kind of way where you can be making good contact with eye contact with your camera. Um, and, you know, your notes aren't over here and things like that. Um, and just takes a little practice and set up. Um, yeah, it's I, harder I, to convey your enthusiasm. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You finished up. Uh, okay. I was just saying it's, it's, it's harder to convey your enthusiasm through a virtual session um but everyone's in that same situation so um you, you have to kind of practice and just be ready for it yeah what, what i was just going to say i i help coach for our graduating uh mstp students as they're interviewing for residencies so they're in the same boat um some of the things you can control are your background so uh you know try not to pick something that's going to distract us um from or take away attention from what you're saying um, but I think the biggest thing is just to know that you do have to be, um, as Dr. Gray mentioned, a little bit more performative because it's really easy to get comfortable in your chair and to relax and do all the things you would never do when you're doing public speaking or you would be encouraged not to do. You're doing that for hours on end on Zoom. And so um, just working to make sure you're staying hydrated, caffeinated, uh, whatever your stimulant of choice is to make sure that that is not setting like or zapping your energy and you're just feeling kind of low. Um, just be really cognizant of that, that this is, it does, it is very taxing on the body, even though you're not doing anything physical. I think it's also important you don't give the spiel that you have prepared a, a talk from A to Z and you go on without interruptions and, you know, you have a 30 minutes interview and 20 minutes you take to respond to the first question because you have it so prepared. 
And I just, you know, just give the chance to pause, uh, to let the person on the other side to ask questions, make it conversational, be yourself, don't uh, necessarily be on a scene. Yeah, absolutely. You have to allow us to get in there and ask questions. We may say, tell us about your research, but those little pauses are really important for us to ask questions. And our questions really are just to kind of take you off of your script and and find out how you really talk about the science. Um, so, um, you know, it's important that you, you you provide those little pauses and take a breath and you know, keep it a discussion. All right. To follow up on that, do you have advice for when you don't click with an interviewer or feel your one-on-one -on -one interviews did not go well? It happens. <laughs> happens to all of us. Yeah, I don't know if I necessarily have advice. Um, sometimes you may think your interview went very poorly and it didn't. That would just say one thing. Um, and everybody has different interview styles, so I'm sure... All of, all of each of our programs have multiple interviews that you're going to be coming through. So um, like in sports, I would not, I would, if you feel like one interview didn't go well, shake it off and move forward with the next interview. Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to hold one 20 or 30 minute interaction with you uh, when the summation of everything may be positive. They're not going to hold that one thing against you. I totally agree with that. And remember, you're not interviewing just with one individual, but with uh, multiple people. So if one doesn't go well, just shake it off and move on. Yeah, I mean, it could be that your interests are completely different or your personalities are completely different. And that's not going to be the same for everybody that you're speaking with. Decision time is great, but we're human. We're not gods. <laughs> All right, this is going to be a program specific question. Does your program have a chalk talk for your research as part of the interview? And if so, do you have tips for how to do well on this? We do not. We, we do. Um, uh, so I'll, I will say ours has grown. So before the days of COVID, when we were in person, it was a I think we allowed for seven minutes. Um, it was a true chalk talk on a whiteboard, no slides. You just told us about your science with a panel of us. And we got to ask questions, I think for three to five minutes. Um, up until this year, it had been um, kind of recorded PowerPoints that we typically would review before interviewing with you and would discuss it with you afterwards. Um, this year, we're trying to pilot something that is somewhere in the middle of that where perhaps there's three minutes for us to review uh, excuse me, again, seven minutes for all of us to review, again, virtually and interact with you. Uh, the advice I would give is, I think many of us have said, which is this is a give and take with your science. This is not you just regurgitating information to us. It's our opportunity to really um, press you a little bit the way science should um, about what what you know and your, your knowledge about it. And again, uh, that's our best way to get to know you. But we, we do have a chalk talk uh, aspect to the interview. We do not, although we plan to implement it for the in-person visit for those students that we invite to uh, revisit in person. Yeah, we have, we have discussed it, but don't have that yet. We have a question in the chat. If you're working on the data generation for a collaborative project but did not contribute to data analysis, how should you make yourself stand out? And this is team science, no? Uh, when you do uh, patients' data, whether it is collections, analysis, you're a contributor, no? So I think, uh, again, like in any other uh, uh, contractual agreement, it's important to speak the term upfront. So if you join a lab where you're asked to collect data, you may want to sit with the investigator upfront and say, what am I going to get out of this? Am I going to just be a knowledge? not a knowledge, an author, a co-author, you have all the right to ask and set the condition up front. You know, you are the CEO of your own career, your startup company, and you're the one putting the conditions and the sooner you do it, the better.
yeah, try to be as involved as you can. Ask questions, say, hey, can you show me how you did this? You know, however you can uh, be more involved. How to convey it after the fact. Um, you just have to have it where it's at, but also know what the know what you were doing and what the science was. Even if you didn't do the analysis, you need to know this, you know, why the study was done and, you know, what was found and, you know, what questions it raised and what the next steps would be, those kinds of things to show that you were really invested in the project. The follow up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the only thing I would add, and this is the case for any graduate student on a thesis committee, if you're going to talk about the results of something, um, I think you should be prepared to talk about that data analysis, even though you may not have been involved doing it. If you're if you're going to bring it up, then it's fair game to ask questions about it, and you want to avoid the "why well, didn't I didn't do that" answer. That doesn't usually go very well. I was going to follow up on that question. Do your programs have a specific number of publications that you would want? ideally for an applicant to have, or if they don't have any publications that are published, um, is that to their detriment? I will say we do not have any publication minimum expectation. Of course, we note that if you've published, but considering the time delay between doing work to actual publication, um, I, I don't hold students to that. Um, I'd say the only caveat, if you've been you know, you mentioned gap years before, if you've had multiple, multiple gap years in the same environment, but don't have a publication, I probably would want to hear from you as to why, why that is. But for undergrads coming straight out, no, um, that's, that's not a, a full on expectation. Same year, we don't have expectation for applicants if, uh, unless they have a very large uh, amount of gap years, uh, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I was going to say. The but same the thing. letter of your research mentor is very, very important. Is among the letters you submit is probably the most valuable one, the one I look at the most, you know, to see whether you're really passionate about your research and whether you are going to be skilled for a research career. I look at those letters very carefully. Yeah, publication number is definitely not uh, a criteria. I'd like to see that, that you have presented your work somewhere, but there are many opportunities that could be presenting at some undergraduate research event at your university, but, you know, some sort of, you know, presenting your work, the work, uh, it doesn't need to be a publication, but like they said, if somebody's been in a lab for a long time and there's nothing to show for it, that is, does raise a red flag. Okay, we have a follow up from um, an attendee in the chat. If there are publications that will be submitted slash published, oh, these appear. Yeah, disappeared. Um, if there are publications that will be submitted slash published throughout the cycle, what can we do to address that to update schools? Would it help to improve chances for an interview slash acceptance if we have no publications at the time? Usually that if there's a publication that is in the in the works or the work is leading towards a publication, you know, your mentor probably has mentioned it in the letter. Um, so we know that it's the work is, you know, going to be publishable. Um, so those kinds of updates, I don't think have, you know, a lot of weight. It's not going to suddenly change the equation on um, how we uh, view somebody, I don't think. Um, you know, at that point. Yeah, I would say every every time we've gotten situations like that, it's usually later in the year, not not early on, but it it rarely has ever. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it go from oh, we weren't going to interview you to now we're we're going to interview you because you this paper was all of a sudden published. Um, I, I would say in the application you as we've said, you can say things like, oh, it's in preparation, it's in submission, it's in revision. All of those things tell us that these are, your work is progressing towards something. And I think we're all used to that, that time frame of trying to get something published. It's part of the whole gap year discussion of 
ideally minimizing how much people have gap years. And I think yeah. most programs have really moved away from really thinking about the number of publications because it just has led to those gap years getting longer and longer. That makes sense. Well, unfortunately, that was the last question that we have time for tonight. So with that, I just want to thank you all for joining us for our Q&A session today with the program directors. I want to thank our panelists for their time, the participants who made this session so interactive and so many people including APSA, Diversity Ad Hoc, PR, Partnerships Committees, and APSA leadership that not only put these sessions together and worked to make sure the UIM applicants received word of it as well. Our next interact interactive session will be next month, and so please stay tuned if you're applying to a program this year. And for more information, you can go to our website and look at our interactive sessions available. Please also stay tuned via social media and look out for further emails to register for upcoming events. And thank you all again for coming. Thank you. Good luck with your applications. Thank you all.